Hello everybody, my name is Owen, and I am so excited to have the opportunity to talk to you about my favorite composer today. If you don't know me, I'm Owen, and I am somewhat ensconced in the classical community, and people know me because I talk their ears off about obscure composers. I've heard hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands of different people. Some of them, you can understand why their legacy has fallen apart, but plenty of others, you listen to them and you wonder, how has their music been so bastardized, been so forgotten? And I'm gonna to talk to you about one of those composers. This is a composer who Puccini said had more music in his head than Puccini's and Mascagni's combined. A composer who a Nobel Prize winner said, you could not understand how popular they were in their native country. Opera singers of the day like Beniamo Gili or Enrico Caruso sang them, and he was conducted by the likes of Toscanini and Mahler. But he was still friends with Pope Pius X, and he was working for five different popes throughout his career. I could go on, but I trust that the music of Lorenzo Perosi speaks for itself. Perosi was born in 1872 to a family of church musicians, and this would start his lifelong dedication to conservatively rooted, yet post-romantically styled, sacred music. His father was a disciple of the Sicilian movement, which aimed to reclaim the early music of the Catholic Church. Perosi studied in Regensburg and also in Solema Abbey. Both of these had a huge influence on him because they were places where Gregorian chant was being revived. And this had a huge influence on his music, where he would use a lot of the same modal melodies that you could see in Gregorian chant in a whole new, unique way of his own time. Perosi would then go on to study at the Milan Conservatory, during which time he received a professional post as an organist and piano teacher at the Benedictine Abbey of Monte Cassino until receiving his degree. After that, he became the Maestro di Capella at San Marco's Basilica in Venice, which helped him connect with Cardinal Giuseppe Sarto, who was better known as Pope Pius X, who is now a saint. Sarto named Perosi a priest, and Perosi would then go on to lead daily masses. This wasn't very unique. There are plenty of priests who do this, but he would shoot to stardom very soon for something completely different and very progressive, even if still following in the footsteps of what he loved. You may know this subject, but you may not know it as Perosi created it, the sacred oratorio. Before we go any further, I'm just gonna discuss the basics of what the oratorio is. The oratorio is usually a sacred work and often among the largest scale works in the classical canon. They're for voices, chorus, and orchestra and are in multiple acts with the same proportions as an opera, for example. There are examples of very famous oratorios like Handel's Messiah or Bach's Passions that come to mind. That being said, the oratorio did become um, a bit obsolescent over time during the Romantic era. In fact, before Perosi, the last famous oratorio that most people would recognize nowadays might have been Mendelssohn's Elijah, and before that you'd probably have to go back to Haydn even. It just didn't have the same amount of grandiosity that it used to have, and that was because it was supplanted with something very similar, yet different enough to take audiences away from the oratorio, and that was the opera. In terms of music, the opera was almost identical to the oratorio. Oratorios, although usually sacred, could also be secular. Operas could usually be secular, but sometimes they were sacred. The only thing that really differed them was a big enough difference for audiences who could only see oratorios or operas by going to see them live. Operas had the stage, while oratorios usually tried to stay away from that. And as a result, people perceived oratorios as lacking the necessary drama. That is, until Lorenzo Perosi came along. In 1897, when he was 25, Perosi published his first oratorio, La Passione de Cristo Secondo San Marco, and that was the first of 12 he would publish over the next decade. You may not have heard about Perosi before clicking on this video, but if you were around in the turn to the 20th century in Italy, you knew his name if you were part of musical circles. Mascagni called Perosi a hurricane of light and music, he had his music performed at the Sistine Chapel. He was part of the Giovanni Scuola, a subset of the most popular Verismo composers of the day. And he was the only one that didn't write opera, by the way, because he preferred his oratorios. He fell under the wing of his old friend, Pope Pius X. The New York Times talked about how he was a champion in Italy. 
Unfortunately, just as quickly as he shot up to stardom, his popularity waned. This is, thanks in most part, due to the fact that his music wasn't as influenced by Palestrina as his successors, because the Sicilian movement was even more devout than he was when it came to sticking to the roots of the Catholic traditions. A lot of the tension definitely came off of him musically. He would trend a lot more towards Impressionism and even Neoclassicism, something that the Catholic Church definitely would not have liked from their premier composer. Perosi would die in 1956, and since then he has hardly been revived despite people's best efforts. He's now virtually unknown outside of organists, choruses, and intense fanatics of classical music like myself. But I'm here to try and change that as much as I can. So as I just illustrated, Perosi was something special, despite what his popularity may suggest. He was famous all throughout Europe and had such admirers as Debussy, Puccini, Mascagni, Elgar, Mahler, Toscanini, Respighi, Martucci, Vincent Dandy, Emmanuel Wolf-Ferrari, Carl Nielsen, Enrico Caruso, St. Luigi Orlone, and Pope Pius X. But why? Why was he so famous? What did he write that was so worthy of his legacy? Finally, is it worthy of revival? Hopefully, after you listen, you'll realize why that is such a stupid question to ask. As my friends can confirm, I have gone on many tangents about how I hate comparing composers to one another. It can undermine a composer's creativity if you try and compare them with another, better-known composer. It's a necessary utensil, though, for helping somebody who hasn't heard a certain composer understand what they sound like. For Perosi, however, that's not an easy thing to do. I often refer to him as a love style of Bach and Puccini, but no two composers can capture the eclecticism of his music. It also includes traces of Planchant, of Palestrina, of Mozart, of Wagner, and of Bruckner, and it all creates his very own sound world, which I'll discuss today. Any single one of his oratorios could explain his sound world well, but I'm gonna show you the one that shot him to fame in the first place. La Passione de Cristo Secondo San Marco. And from the very offset, you hear one of the most important parts of Perosi's style, and that is his counterpoint. I remember recommending Perosi to a friend after he lauded Franz Schmidt for his counterpointal Fourth Symphony. I have recommended dozens upon dozens of composers to that same person, all of whom he rejected, but even he admitted that Perosi had a gift. That being said, he doesn't have the same kind of counterpoint that you associate with other composers of the same era. People like Schmidt and Rager and Josef Marx, other contemporaries, they had a lot deeper, darker, and muddier even of a sound. But Perosi's was a lot lighter, not necessarily frivolous, but it had the same vein as Bach, constantly, almost fugal. After the prelude, which is in the same Bachian counterpoint, his oratorio is mostly made up of three different kinds of things. You have your aria, you have your unaccompanied choruses, and you have your choruses with accompaniment. Usually that would be the orchestra. His arias are almost in a bit of a Puccini vein, or Mascagni, or Celia, or Giordano. It's all in that same Verissimo vein with whom he had ensconced himself, and who all admired him very much. The choruses are very different. The unaccompanied choruses have the same kind of style as Palestrina, or of other people in the early Renaissance vein or the late medieval vein. But then with his accompanied courses, that's where his counterpoint really shows off its skill, because it almost sounds like something straight out of Handel's Messiah. And that really showcases one of the things that made Perosi so accessible to everybody in his era. And that has to do with the many different ways he could show off the glory of Christianity. Christianity is the largest religion in the world, and it's probably the most diverse in terms of interpretation, not just of the literary texts, not just of the key figures, not just of the historical events, but also in how people let the religion influence them. An evangelical knocking at your door with the Jesus loves you sign might romanticize religion as a traditional folksy way to get communities to connect to each other. A Catholic priest leading a midnight mass might envision this religion as an intimate, soulful affair in which one must grapple not just with God, but with his mortal self. A medieval Akatin peasant might view Christianity almost as a fairy tale in which he can escape his life, look upon the lives of those who escaped his own situation, and he can use it to hope for a better future. 
and then a literary figure like Dante might focus more on the drama of it all, the sheer magnitude of the most important parts of Christianity, be it heaven, be it hell, be it all of the creatures who he discusses. Of course, those are four very different ways that people let Christianity influence their lives. None of them are right, none of them are wrong, it's all subjective. So long as they let their religion positively impact them, it's completely fine. But the thing is, when it comes to writing music for religious purposes, you're gonna have trouble connecting with each one of those figures. Just to illustrate this dichotomy, let's look at three very famous Christian pieces. Handel's Messiah, Bruckner's Te Deum, and number one from Messiaen's Vintergards. Handel's Messiah opts for a more pastoral, traditionally celebratory route that feels like a festival on a summer's day. Bruckner's Te Deum feels like it wishes to portray the same drama of Dante's divine comedy with exploring Christianity's grandest concepts. Messiaen's First Regard sounds like it should be played in a stone monastery at night. All three of these pieces are very effective in addition to many other pieces I'm hoping to share later on this channel. But since people interpret religion in countlessly different ways, people will have one of these interpretations which they will inevitably prefer over the others. With Perosi, it's incredible because he manages to explore Christianity in all of these ways and in many others. His climaxes take on a more Brucknerian tone with the full drama that he could accomplish with what he had in his fingertips all expressed in the most grand way. His a cappella chorales are a lot smoother, a lot more introspective, and then you have a few accompanied choruses which again have the same sort of pastoral vibe as Handel's Messiah. It all celebrates the Christian faith in different ways for different people. Perosi doesn't restrict himself to trying to perfect one method of exalting Christ through music. He succeeds in as many methods as he tries, and this allowed him to achieve international celebrity. His orchestral music is delightfully accessible and his chamber music is very daring relative to the rest of his oeuvre, which you can check out. Naxus has a wonderful recording that just came out last year. But there is a good reason that Perosi's legacy as we understand it lies on his religious music. It is the most complete envisionment of religion and music as we know it. Perosi wrote over 20 oratorios, several dozen masses, and a few hundred different motets. So much sacred music out there to explore, much of which hasn't even been published yet. So I would say, if you're a religious person, I definitely recommend Perosi. He envisions the same stories we read in the Bible in a whole new way, but in a way where you can still feel the Christian connection. If you're not religious, that's okay. Listen to it the same way you listen to La Boheme by Puccini, for instance, because the music still has the same drama. Perosi did say that his oratorios were like his operas. Really, Perosi might be the greatest sacred composer since 1800, because he captures so many different styles that I can't even confidently say there is a Perosian style. There are a few, there might even be up to a dozen different Perosian styles. And he's so eclectic, every piece has something different to offer you can always look forward to it. So I would check out his oratorios, his orchestral suites are fun, his chamber works are invigorating. Everything that is out there for you to explore is worth it. I was talking to friends when we talked about composers with whom we had had sacred experiences. And I felt left out because a lot of my favorite composers don't have as much recordings. So I was thinking, I don't really have that person. And then I remembered the glory that my experiences with Perosi have offered. It's unlike anything I've felt with any other composer because I can feel so many different emotions in so many different ways that I couldn't even compare to any other great composer. So truly, he's worth your time. And I hope that your experiences with him are as delightful and life-changing as mine. Thank you for watching.